Rob was urging me, and I had listened to Governor Brown's podcast with uh, David Axelrod as an example. He was also recently on the News Hour um, because he he's lived through this. And when you ask, well, what's the alternative? Governor Brown's administration can be an alternative. But let me let me just uh, refer to some a construct you used. Our democracy depends on, or the the moral legitimacy derives from. Because you were using, you were saying finance, democracy, the people, the people's conviction in, in integrity, uh, the ability to to actually self-govern, um, and that depends on uh, the reliability of information, which is something we focus on every weekend on the show that I do. Um, that is this conundrum of a Facebook or a Twitter that is engaged in, uh, on its best days, um, dissemination of uh, the truth um, and furthering the ambitions of the First Amendment and journalists' ability to get that to constituencies and, and uh, people across the country, on its, on its worst days, um, plays into uh, a machine that is a monetized fraud. Mm -hmm. And so I really, by fraud, I mean misinformation. If you want to call it fake news, you can call it fake news. But the fact that the YouTubes and Facebooks and um, Twitters, they, they are, are willfully uh, negligent and, and complicit a lot of times in the perpetuation of that mm -hmm. fraud, mm -hmm. what, what I've called in Denmark uh, the monetization of misinformation. And my, my question to you as we are here Considering, again, the, the assets, the, the best case and worst case scenario of American finance and, and the economic engine that can rescue people's livelihood or defeat it is, you know, ultimately, um, the markets can, can tolerate um, only so much fraud and, and eventually um, the markets may be what, what seem to be Donald Trump's evidence of a, 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 an American revival, ultimately the math can go the other way and really reflect what has been this um, tremendous disparity of wealth uh, in the fact. And so I'm wondering to if and when you project that the markets will um, pr uh, prove or dem you know, demonstrate that a lot of this wealth is manufactured um, or inflated to the point of, of you know, a, a new crisis um, emerging. Um, it, because at the end of the day, I think that Donald Trump saw the impact of his tweets when they were directed at particular companies and the backlash he got from traditional, you know, Milton Friedman style economists and conservative thinkers. So at the end of the day, he can't say the, the, the stock market's a hoax. Like what he said about President Obama's birth certificate, what he says about a lot of things, uh, the Russia investigation. He can't say, uh, the Dow was down, down 500 today. What a hoax, right? So um, <laughs> eventually, that is going to happen, is it not? We'll see. We'll see. I'll, t I'll take I mean, it. But isn't, I'll take isn't, that, isn't that a firewall, though? Isn't, isn't the American capitalistic system actually a firewall? I mean, when, when so few people okay. in his own party I'm, I'm, I'm good. I'm enjoying this. No, I'm, uh, I'm, <laughs> we're, you guys all have to read Stephen Fraser's book, A Wall Street American Dream Palace, yeah. where he talks about there are four times types of people that succeed on Wall Street. One are called the aristocrats. In, the, in that world, it, what he's referring to is a kind of sense of stewardship, a very healthy mm -hmm. sense, a custodian of ethical markets and others. Uh, then there is the group called the con men who are able to do things, uh, you know, float companies that have never had earnings at great multiples that dissipate 18 months later. Uh, I can't remember the, the other two right now, but the, the, he, he basically says it doesn't matter any of the four as long as you're in a rising tide. The, the system can tolerate those. And he goes back to the robber barons and the formation of railroads and some of the scams around that. It, but he, what he forecasts is that in the, from late Ronald Reagan to the present, 
in the era of globalization, what we're doing is dismantling the productive structure of America, and finance is making a lot of money. Right. And so now, the, the question of what makes money can be controversial and at odds with the well-being of the American people. Right. And so these controversies and these questions of confidence and faith in the system, as opposed to the skills of a particular financier, are very much in play. What is different today from the precipice of the Great Depression, to just use a, mm -hmm. a contrasting historical landmark, um, what is different today in terms of the vulnerabilities? Mm -hmm. um, certainly FDIC advances have been made to protect the little guy or regular people. Um, but, you know, when I, when I visited the University of Nebraska in Lincoln, I remember talking to students around 08 and in the immediate aftermath of the crisis and mm -hmm. I said you know they weren't fully cognizant that folks wouldn't be playing football but they would have been lining up for bread in that stadium had the bailouts not happened um, so there is a, a, a complete lack of you know it's sort of like a historical um, disconfiguration misconfiguration lack of consciousness around that moment versus today Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm, I'm wondering. Yeah, there, I think there's some. Uh, yeah. you, you alluded to it. The FDIC, uh, which really is the operative arm of deposit insurance, we don't have as many potential runs on banks, though it's a bit dangerous. With now the big concentration of banks, an awful lot of their liabilities are way above the threshold of insur deposit insurance. So you can have them be unstable but for the fact that you have the discount window in the Fed creating contingent liquidity mm -hmm. and, and stopping a run that way. Uh, the other piece, like it or not, regardless of your ideology, is the size of government spending as a proportion of total demand is much larger and isn't as reactive to what might call short-term collapses of confidence. Mm -hmm. So there's a stabilizing factor there, whether it's the defense budget or the unemployment insurance or whatever, all of that stuff is more resilient. Mm -hmm. So when the downturn happened in the 1930s, by 1932, you're in the 20s on unemployment. This last time we got to what, 11, 13 percent. Right. Uh, so and how, how is the extent of the speculation different in the it, way that it, it can yeah. hurt? Person. Yeah. The scale of speculation now is orders of magnitude larger. In the 1920s and 30s, we were going through a very profound structural transformation in America from an agricultural-based economy to a manufacturing-based economy. And uh, some very wonderful papers have been written on this, like uh, Bruce Greenwald from Columbia Business School, and I'll cite Ian uh, Joseph Stiglitz co-authored. And it's interesting because one is a libertarian on the right, and one is very much a kind of democratic left. But they talked about how what happened was essentially there was a collapse in farm wages and farm credit as you didn't need so many people working on the farms. Well, when those people lose their wages, they don't have the ability to buy manufactured goods. So in those days, the equivalent of Silicon Valley was a place called Cleveland, Ohio. Cleveland, Ohio was the innovation center of manufacturing. And Cleveland went bankrupt after we got to World War II war preparation, so there was aggregate demand. Cleveland was reconstituted, the manufacturing economy took off, and all the people that were shed from the agricultural system moved into uh, manufacturing, migrated to the northern part of the Midwest. And so there was a very profound structural transformation there. Analogous, but not quite of the same scale, related to globalization and the development of China. Manufacturing was further diminished in the United States and we move towards a service economy. So when we look at the what you might call the velocity of change of the composition of employment and production, mm -hmm. there are similarities, but the scale, the, the velocity and violence of the 30s was a bigger, bigger change than now. When you think of that speculation um, being much more rampant today and the fact that there is 
rather little accountability when it comes to ensuring that there is reinvestment, right? The, the reinvestment is taking place in communities and there really aren't any regulatory frameworks, just as there aren't in public media or commercial media these days. You know, the, as Newt Minow said to me years ago, it's a miracle we have something like PBS um, in this capitalistic system. So your institute is devoted to new economic thinking. How, how, if there are any mechanisms through which we can, try to ensure that that speculation is not just in the pursuit of, um, yeah. yeah, channeling, which you might call right, capital, exactly. into yeah. capital formation and productivity is the underlying basis and rationale right. in economic and financial literature. The problem that we've had is that, and this is beautifully articulated, by the way, my colleague uh, Adair Turner wrote a book called Between Debt and the Devil, the Princeton Press put out about a year ago. He studied Great Britain and he said, you've got this enormous architecture of guarantees and central banks around something that doesn't really lend any money to manufacturing anymore. It doesn't really enhance productivity. It's largely involved in real estate speculation and what he calls positional goods, meaning like the city of London or coastal properties. And that when he criticizes Thomas Piketty's uh, mm -hmm. track on wealth capital in the 21st century, he says this isn't about the relationship between growth and interest rates. This is about a boom, a bubble in positional goods and real estate lending and, this, and that the financial sector is really devoted to things that aren't worthy of guarantees, other than the fact that they can disrupt you on the downside. <laughs> and they not, once you start going over the cliff, I know, uh, everybody's, what is it, uh, Robert Lucas, the conservative economist said, everybody's a Keynesian in the foxhole. Right, right. Uh, and there are some really clear deliverables that, that a president who prided himself as a builder could say, these reinvestments are going to go to infrastructure and you're going to see in four years. You know, uh, revitalized um, airports, bridges, tunnels, but you know that. Yeah. Anyway, I want to. Uh, let me yeah. just say one last asterisk on this. If I was going to ask you as an audience to do one thing, be very skeptical and scrutinize very closely the notion of privatizations and private-public partnerships, because when you create what looked like the financial system in the early 2000s related to housing which was a heads I win, tails you lose structure. The upside, you know, everybody's criticized Obama when he didn't nationalize Citibank uh, in 2009. And he said, well, that would be socialism. And when I was debating Larry Summers one night in Washington, I said, what do you mean it would be socialism? You've already socialized the downside, we're just fighting about the upside. Okay. These one-sided bets are an enormous toxin on the health of our public finances. And these games that are played in the management of pension money and the fees earned by alternative investments and then com complaining after they've sucked all these fees out and given campaign contributions to politicians and consulting agreements to pension fiduciaries that we don't have enough to pay the people that work for 45 years, that's the kind of stuff that has to end to get us back on the democratic path that, that you, how you say, challenged me to try to envision. Thank you, Rob. Thank you.